If you have ever played a From Software game like Dark Souls, Sekiro, Bloodborne, or Elden Ring, you would know that a lot of psychological themes are present in them. Hope, despair, tenacity, madness. But today I want to talk about one in particular, powerlessness. When we think of the Souls genre, the first thing that will come to most people's mind is, you died. The famous catchphrase that acts as a slogan to either scare away the lesser willed, or invite those who seek a challenge. Dying is a major overarching theme in all of the Souls games, not only from a gameplay perspective, but a narrative one as well. In Dark Souls, the Curse of the Dark Sign prevents those branded from death. In Sekiro, the power of the Dragon Heritage allows rebirth. And in Elden Ring, the Guidance of Grace ushers the Tarnished toward their purpose. The creative visionary behind the Souls games, Hidetaka Miyazaki, has stated on multiple occasions that the themes of death and difficulty were intentionally designed to give players a very specific feeling, one of satisfaction. Quote, I think death is a crucial element when designing games around the theme of the satisfaction of overcoming overwhelming odds. If you had a game that said, oops, you're dead, now switch off the game, it wouldn't be very successful. So you need to have something to teach and be there to learn from, and we feel that death in video games is a positive experience. The last sentence is one that has stood out to me because it goes against what we would intuitively or heuristically assume about video game design. When a player experiences death or frustration, they are less likely to enjoy their overall experience, or so we tend to think. The idea of difficulty being a deterrent is something that is widely accepted and even designed around in AAA video game development. I'd like to give a summary of a relatively substantial section of a game theorist video from 2019. I'll include a link to that video down in the description box below. Games like Bioshock and Assassin's Creed intentionally make it so that your last point of health is worth more than all of the others before, allowing you to survive just one more hit or to make an epic comeback, putting you on the edge, giving you the position of being the underdog. Games like Crash Bandicoot introduce what's called dynamic difficulty, or difficulty that changes behind the scenes the more you lose, such as giving you an extra life or slowing enemies down. This makes sense. In a large amount of the best-selling games worldwide, you are the hero, you have the power, and you are the chosen one. In Skyrim, you are the Dragonborn, in Halo, you are Master Chief, and in Devil May Cry, you are the half-demon spawn of a legendary demon who is so powerful, you can take a sword through your chest and be fine with it. This feeling of power is satisfying. It is especially fun because this is a level of control that is not often experienced in day-to-day -day life. Most people aren't legendary heroes whose decisions will impact the entire world over. Most people don't even get to pick their work schedule. There is a reason these styles of games are referred to as power fantasies. They exist to give us an experience that is far beyond reality. And there is nothing wrong with that. Obviously, there is a reason they tend to sell so incredibly well. Here is where we start to talk about Elden Ring and the Souls genre, though. What happens if you take that power away? What happens if instead of the demon with a sword in his chest casually walking around, you are now the minion that just tried to stab him? Essentially, you have the opposite of a power fantasy. You are no longer starting out as the pinnacle of strength, but are instead an insignificant pawn in the grand scheme of the universe. Most psychological analyses of the Souls games would likely attribute this to difficulty, and they wouldn't be wrong. But I believe that the specific psychological theme of powerlessness has a special place in this conversation. You see, powerlessness can be utilized from a game design and thematic perspective in a meaningful way, but the line between complete powerlessness and godlike ability is quite hard to ride. So how do the Souls games do it? Essentially, it's potential. In the Souls genre, you start out as a nobody, even if you have a starting class, and that you really are just some guy or girl who kind of woke up one day to find themselves in a dying world. You are not some destined hero or chosen one. The landscape is full of things bigger and badder than you. Bigger is actually a very specific point here. Have you noticed in the Souls games how many bosses and enemies tower over you? In the original Dark Souls, there are 22 bosses, and only three of them are vaguely the size of a human. Gwendolyn, Pinwheel, and of course Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. All of which are still technically bigger than you. Elden Ring, due to its sheer number of bosses, has a few more that are somewhat in the realm of human-sized. But overall, most major bosses are much larger than the player character. The Tree Sentinel, Margit, Godric, all bosses in the very first zone and likely the first ones you will encounter, all of which are two to three times your size. This is, in my opinion, a very deliberate choice from a game design perspective. The reason the Tree Sentinel stands right outside of the tutorial is because Elden Ring wants to very quickly teach you that the 15 foot tall horseman in golden armor will happily crush you into the ground unless you are experienced. If you didn't assume that as a player, you are likely to find it out firsthand. This instills in the player immediately that the world is dangerous, that this is not a hack and slash power fantasy where you can press one button and stunlock the enemy until they die. The message is clear, as of right now, you have no power. A sentiment clearly displayed by the very first NPC that you come into contact with. Without guidance, without the strength of runes, and without an invitation to the round table hold, 
you are fated, it seems, to die in obscurity. So, you go out, you explore a little, you gain the ability to level up and maybe upgrade gear, you clear a minor boss or two, and in the back of your mind you think, one day I will return to this tree sentinel and show him who's boss. The fact that most players are forced to bypass the first major enemy they see gives the player an immediate goal to work towards, a reason to push themselves closer to their potential. After quite a few hours of gameplay, you come back for the rematch and you get the satisfaction of taking him down. You started out powerless, but now you aren't. Well, until you meet Margaret. Flame of ambition. Someone must extinguish thy flame. From a gameplay, lore, and literal perspective, Margaret exists as a gatekeeper. He is meant to show you the extent of your powerlessness, but also to praise you very subtly for making it to him. You have ambition and it is what got you to where you are. He essentially tells you, your willpower has brought you here, you think you have power. Allow me to show you how little power you have. The average newcomer to Souls games is likely to see Margit as a major roadblock, and this is very intentional. This is where the idea of potential comes into play. Power and potential are two very related concepts, but they are actually not the same. You see, in Souls games, you start off at the first percentile of power. You are weak, fragile, and can do little to damage enemies or protect yourself but a lack of power does not inherently mean a lack of potential for power. World-class athletes didn't start out breaking records, and your level 1 character doesn't start out as a godslayer. Well, unless you've beaten the game a ton and can do a level 1 run. Your character has the ability to level up, strengthen themselves, acquire new gear, and become stronger. Just like you, as a player, have the ability to increase your knowledge of the bosses, become more skillful, and understand the game better. One way to visualize it is like this. Imagine that in Skyrim you start at the 80th percentile for power and you can work your way up. As the Dragonborn, a legendary hero, you are already destined for greatness even if you haven't reached your full potential. You have powers and abilities that are completely unique to you. There really isn't a skill curve or a vast amount of knowledge needed to beat the strongest of foes. In Souls games, it's the opposite. You start at the bottom and enemies and bosses can do a bunch of awesome stuff that you can't. That said, while maybe you can't do everything they can do, you can do something they can't. Get stronger. You can make it to the top all the same, it will just require more effort and thought. This effort is what turns a lot of people away from the Souls genre. Why should I waste my time trying to overcome a challenge that is so clearly designed to not be in my favor? Well, in the same vein, why should a student struggle through a degree or a certification to get a job they want? Why should a recovering alcoholic struggle through the pain of withdrawals and temptations? Why should someone suffering from depression struggle through negative thoughts about themselves and others? The answer is, well, because the light at the end of the tunnel is worth it. And sometimes, counterintuitively, a challenge is what is needed to give someone a light. A similar video to this one by a YouTuber I respect, Daryl Talks Games, covered the topic of how Souls games save you. Now there have been numerous individuals who have reported that Souls games in particular have given them a semblance of control over their own life. I will link to his video in the description box below and I encourage you highly to watch that video if you haven't already. One concept that I want to discuss that wasn't discussed in that video though is resilience. Let's take a look at an American Psychological Association definition for resilience. Psychologists define resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress, such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, or workplace and financial stressors. As much as resilience involves bouncing back from these difficult experiences, it can also involve profound personal growth. The last sentence is what I think Miyazaki is attempting to give players with the Souls genre of games. You see, difficulty, when it is tailored in such a way that it is not meant to completely overwhelm or frustrate you with no chance of ever succeeding, can make you a stronger-willed person who is willing to face even more adversity. It can show you that even though you might not have power, you do have potential. This idea of a specific level of difficulty being beneficial for growth is supported from a few different psychological theories. First is the theory of evolution of fair play, which shows that when two rats are playing with one another and one has a clear advantage, usually the larger rat, if the one with a clear advantage does not allow the other one to win at least sometimes, roughly 30% of the time, the losing rat won't want to play or interact anymore. This is something that I believe that Miyazaki understood well. To quote him once again, To be fulfilled, you must have a goal that needs fulfilling. At the same time, it must actually be possible to fulfill said goal. This is why after a few deaths to a boss to learn its attacks, you still feel okay. 
but after death 10, you may decide it's time to go level up for a bit and come back later. Or if you lose too much, you might even quit for the day. Or, why if you are playing a game like Street Fighter with a friend, and you stomp them 10 times in a row, it isn't likely for them to want to keep on playing with you. In these situations, you are experiencing powerlessness. You haven't yet utilized your potential, or the challenge is currently too far outside of your character or skill level, so the act of engaging in the activity isn't mentally worth it. Our brains are relatively good at deciding if an activity is worth it, treating time and energy as a resource. So if we face a challenge that is too oppositional, we won't want to engage in it even if we could theoretically grow from it in the long run. Another psychological theory that supports this idea is the zone of proximal development, which proposes that the perfect level of learning exists between the space of, I can easily do this on my own, and I couldn't do this even with help. If you crush a boss on your first attempt, you aren't likely to feel any real accomplishment. It might feel nice to win, but it won't likely feel like you overcame a true challenge, like you grew from the experience. On the other hand, if you lose to a boss 20 times, you are more likely to feel completely powerless in the situation, like it is out of your control to win, and thus you can't grow from that direct experience. Let's look at fighting games once again as an example. The reason these games have ranking systems is because as you rank up, you will, hopefully at least, be placed against opponents within a few tiers of skill or rank as you. Within this space of one up or one down is where an individual is most likely to experience growth. Not too easy, not too hard. The goal of the Souls experience is to put you in that middle zone where you have all of the tools available to you to win, but you are still fighting an uphill battle, fighting one zone up, where the odds are stacked against you, but not in such a way that the obstacle is insurmountable. Winning while in that center zone, the zone of proximal development, is what leads not only to a true sense of gratification, but also what is more likely to make the skills that you acquired along the way last in your mind. Quoting Miyazaki once again, Overcoming challenges by learning something in a game is a very rewarding feeling, and that's what I wanted to prioritize in Dark Souls. This is separate from how most other game designers design difficulty, in that they aim to put you in the zone of proximal development as well, but they typically want you to be fighting one zone down. In this scenario, you are still learning, but it is overall easier. You might experience the occasional challenge, but a lot of your playtime will be relatively easy. The Dragonborn and Dante aren't invincible, but they are way stronger than anything in their surroundings. This leads to a different trajectory of growth. When most enemies are simply fodder that you can cut through with ease, the only real growth comes from boss encounters or elite enemies. These games go from, you are significantly stronger, to you are slightly stronger, maybe even. The most difficult enemies are essentially being brought up to your skill level or power level compared to the other enemies in the game. In the Souls genre though, the curve instead goes from, you are slightly weaker, maybe even, to you are significantly weaker, moving in the other direction, when you are encountering strong enemies or bosses. This curve, instead of asking you to pay attention for once and finally engage in a challenge, asks you to go from what was already a bit of a challenge to something that is likely to be beyond your current abilities. Essentially, it encourages you to grow from powerlessness and push yourself to a potential that it genuinely believes that you can achieve. This is further reinforced as the philosophy of design when we see that the Souls genre is unwavering in its difficulty. There are no options or sliders in the menus. Every player must experience the same struggles, even if they overcome them in their own unique way. Quoting Miyazaki again, We don't want to include a difficulty selection because we want to bring everyone to the same level of discussion and the same level of enjoyment, so we want everyone to first face that challenge and to overcome it in some way that suits them as a player. Powerlessness isn't always good though, and for an individual to grow from it, it must be balanced in such a way that there is actually a chance at victory. Your growth as a player needs to be able to affect the outcome in a way that extends beyond chance. To give an example of cheap difficulty versus more tailored difficulty, let's look at a game called I Wanna Be The Guy. This is a platforming game in which the entire game is built around you losing repeatedly to tricks that are unfair until you eventually memorize all of the correct steps to take. There is no leveling your character or developing your potential or skill as a player. You are simply losing over and over until a point where you have memorized the tricks. This isn't challenge in the same way Souls games present them. It is instead intended fundamentally from the ground up to be insurmountable without prior knowledge, while a Souls game is designed to be challenging but ultimately conquerable. Another representation of bad powerlessness is when difficulty isn't designed into the game mechanically, and instead numerically. To use Skyrim as an example, if you go into the settings and turn the difficulty all the way up to max, it doesn't make the enemies inherently harder or increase the abilities of their AI, it just gives them bigger damage and health values. This form of difficulty isn't asking you to grow as a player, it is asking you to grow as a character, numerically, in the form of your damage and health. I am not the first to discuss this, as many have before me, but a common phrase shared throughout the Souls games is, don't you dare go hollow. 
which is in reference to the fact that in the Dark Souls universe, a fully hollow human is not one who has fallen from grace or failed, but one who has given up. The philosophy of powerlessness in the Souls genre isn't designed to beat you down to a point where you feel forced into going hollow, into giving up. It's not about difficulty, and it never was. It is instead to present you with a level of adversity that is just out of your comfort range, to encourage you to develop resilience and achieve your potential, to realize that you do have a say even if you are currently at a point in your life where you feel like you don't. Overall, the main point of this analysis is that powerlessness can be a good thing in game design if you are intentional with its implementation, and that experiencing powerlessness in a controlled environment can actually be psychologically healthy by giving you a safe place to develop resilience. There is a reason that people tend to vote for the underdog. There is an immense sense of satisfaction in overcoming the odds and realizing you can do something no one, maybe even yourself, thought you could do. If there's anything that I think Miyazaki wanted people to take away from his games, it's that these philosophies don't just apply to the games themselves. Adversity, challenge, and powerlessness will be present in everyone's life at some point, and it's okay to feel beaten down by them at times, but it's what we decide to do in the face of these feelings that truly matter. Life may try to teach us that we are powerless, but we have the potential to achieve our dreams. So go out there and achieve your victory, defeat your foes, and slay the gods. Thanks for watching.